the podcast that takes a deep dive through the crashing waves of the past to find the all manner of submerged treasures. With you as always are myself, Daniel Nesbitt, and the man I think of the ancient mariner of Footnotes <laughs> of History, Tim Philpott. Um, hi Dan, how's it going? Uh, not too bad, thank you. Captain Philpott. <laughs> um, so what are we talking about today, Tim? Uh, today we're going to be talking about Sidney Smith. Or Sir William Sidney Smith, as his full name is, um, <laughs> is, is a bit confusing. Um, who uh, is is your sort of? Uh, it, we want to say Nelson's Shadow, or your everyman sailor who sort of was. He was there At every major yeah. event. He was there. In fact, actually, I, I will add this later. But but it's quite suspicious that he was at every event. No. Mm-hmm. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. No, no. I'm just. I think he is an interesting case study because yeah. I think of. The Napoleonic Wars at sea. We think of Nelson, yeah. and that's about the extent of our yeah, knowledge. Exactly, exactly. But actually, you know, obviously, he was a, the Royal Navy was a vast um, yeah. sort of behemoth at the time with all these yeah. other personalities and people. Yeah, um, and he was one of the probably one of the most interesting. Ones, yeah. I think. And, and as and as you were just talk, talking about off air, the um, the most of the time they weren't even in contact with their superior officers yeah. because they were sort of in the well. I mean, I mean, if you're in a fleet, obviously, then you would be, but. Uh, Normally, you would have to cope on your own for quite yeah. a long period and of yeah, time. And yeah, captains would have to sail their yeah. ships around or through all manners of. Yeah. Anyone mm-hmm. who's read Hornblower or uh, Patrick O'Brien's novels will know that you know, often you basically <coughs> had an independent command yeah. of, of ships yeah. if you were a captain. Yeah. Um, and then I think he actually typifies this struggle that many must have had with, you know, he was on one hand being asked to be almost like a supreme leader in his own right mm. of his ship and maybe his squadron at different times, but then also be a subordinate to another person every now and again when, yeah. he's, when he's basically told to so yeah. I think that's what we'll see he's kind of struggled with that in terms of actually keeping good um, good relationship with his, with his higher officers yeah, yeah. Um, but should we what, what, sort of con- yeah, what sort of context are we looking at uh, yeah so we, we've got he, he pops up in quite a few different wars throughout the late yeah. 70s well, all of them he, he, he uh, I think he plays a lead, well, he, plays a lead he plays a role in all of the wars yeah and what we're mainly going to be talking about is just quickly give you a bit of background as we can talk about a little bit about the American War of Independence. Mm. So it's, this is the 1770s to 1780s. Mm. Then we're going to talk a little sideshow into what's called the Russo, Russo-Swedish War, um, which is late 1780s. And then we're going to go into probably what most people would recognise from the period of you know, Hornblower and um, and others as being the French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars, so mm. 1789-ish through to 1815, yeah. so the latter period of his career. But I think let's... Go back to the kind of start, shall we? Start, yeah. yeah. Well, he started when he was thirteen. Mm-hmm. That's ludicrous. I know. Yeah, I think he was he was one of these kind of quite horrific trainee officers yeah. that he had as a midshipman, and then he basically it's gets quite, um, he was literally, literally shipped off. Yeah, yeah, literally shipped off to learn his <coughs> trade kind of thing, and then basically educated on a ship of how to how to be an officer. Yeah. But at the same yeah. time, you're still a child, and yeah, this was in 1777, so just after the American War of Independence started, mm. um, and this is where he kind of cut his teeth and got his first taste of both sailing battle, and battle yeah, 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 battle. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, he rose quite quickly he by 1780 he was a lieutenant um, and this was actually quite unusual because he was only 19 at the time and this was under the usual age for a lieutenant so yeah, um, yeah. it shows that he clearly was yeah. from the beginning he was quite capable and yeah. he, he could have marked himself out probably through you know courageous action in battle having a clear head yeah um, plus also I think I mean he I mean as we can see from his later activity actually we, we will go into it but he um is quite resourceful and quite entrepreneurial yeah, yeah, and he think, yeah. sort of comes about thing, mm-hmm. problems he does yeah, yeah and I think this is shown by the fact that during the American Revolution he was given his first independent command as well yeah. as being quite young officer he was given command of a sloop which is quite a small yeah vessel and then also a bit of a larger ship as well later on down the line yeah um so I think yeah it shows that he what this war at the, at the, at the, as an introduction shows that he's a, at the very start of his career yeah. wanting to go places as well as a, in the Navy he doesn't see this as just kind of like a stopgap to yeah. Parliament or a stopgap yeah. to yeah. another trade kind of thing this yeah. is, this is this a career is trade, he's gonna, yeah. this is what he's going to be and, then, and, it, and it is what he turns out to be isn't it yeah no, absolutely and yeah. I think um, so <clears throat> yeah so he's distinguished himself in the American War of Independence but as we all know that war ends in, uh, in 1783 yeah. uh, and like many uh, officers in peacetime he's put on half pay yeah. so um, this is basically where you're retained by the navy but yeah. they don't have enough ships or positions for you so you're put ashore and you get half the amount of money you, you usually yeah, get yeah. because but you're still there on like a retainer in case yeah. another war happens you can be quickly subsumed back into the service yeah it's kind of like, kind of like reserve, I mean it's kind of like a reserve force isn't it but um, yeah. I, I was thinking actually earlier why don't they still do this I don't know I think it it'd might be cheaper <laughs> it'd be cheaper but I think there's probably less I mean, cool. I think because our 
because most armed forces are probably smaller than they were. But yeah, and there are less wars. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then yeah, yeah. we need them. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, whereas this is more of a. Um, yeah, I suppose so. Whereas this is sort of like, oh, at any moment we could be invaded by France. Yeah, kind of thing, I and yeah, also, equally, I think a lot of these officers are on half pay, but basically impoverished. So, well, um, when they were on half pay, yeah, we're kind of uh, yeah. quite not exactly. But yeah, but, but it's not like you can't do something else in the meantime. I mean, I know, I know most of them spend their time gambling and womanising and all this kind of stuff, <laughs> as we know from Hornblower. But anyway, yeah, sorry, let's 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 um, yeah, I mean, it's just an interesting thing, mm, half yeah. pay. Thing. One thing that they did do when they were in half pay was occasionally go and seek service in other armed forces and other navies. Yeah. Um, and this is shown by Stephen Smith's next move, which was... Um, to the Royal Swedish Navy. To the Royal Swedish Navy in 1790. Yeah. Um, and at this time... This is, this is like the, uh, as we were saying before, this is like the interval performance. Yeah. Between the two war... Between, between well, the, talking about the big, the big three big wars of the, of the period we're talking about from the yeah, American... American uh, Revolutionary War, French Revolutionary War, and the Napoleonic Wars. This is between the American Revolutionary War and the French Revolutionary War. Mm-hmm. Quite a lot of revolutions going on yeah. at this point. Um, the age of revolution. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> it even could be that. Um, and this is like sort of what he's doing in the meantime. It's yeah. like, just it's like, okay, well, there's nothing else to do. Maybe Sweden and Russia should have a war. Yeah, well. basically. He kind of like tried his hand at a few different things. So yeah. he'd done a bit of intelligence gathering. I think he basically yeah. seemed to go on holiday to France. Uh, for a bit, and then he looked at how Cherbourg was being developed as a naval port and wrote back to the Admiralty to inform them. He went to Morocco and did a bit of a similar thing there. But then, um, in 1788, Sweden and Russia went to war, mainly mm. because Sweden's king, Gustav III, had seized power in a, in a coup, and he sort of thought that a short, kind of short, sharp war would make his critics fall in line <laughs> um, and, and back him, basically. Yeah. Well, that's, um, that's, that's classic... Uh... Well, what we would define as sort of nation building behaviour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, domestic troubles, let's yeah. have a um have a quick war to make people <laughs> focus their minds elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah, basically yeah. what he thought would happen. And it glorified him as a great leader as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean like, like we were saying, I think we said this before, but like uh, you know, like Argentina. Yeah. The Falklands, um I mean, Germany probably two or three times. Yeah. Uh, well, Bismarck Bismarck I mean yeah. Bismarck in the form of Germany was explicit in the the need for a war mm-hmm. to focus minds on the national I think, yeah. something like that. And I think also in some extent Denmark as well in the Swiss yeah. Holstein War. Indeed. I feel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, the um, war started in 1788, um, and it didn't go very well for Sweden. They were kind of on the back foot throughout quite a lot of it up mm. until around 1790, which is equally, yeah. it also when Sidney Smith joined their ranks. Yeah. Um, and he was given permission by the Amity to join up. Yeah. I'm not sure those th- the two things were in- linked straight away. But, um, <laughs> I was going to say, and then you turn the table. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's, there's a couple of interesting things about this, isn't there? Because, uh, I, don't, I mean, I don't know you're going to go on to this anyway mm-hmm. in a minute, but first of all, um, although in a modern sense we would see Sweden as a bit of a weird, weird for Sweden mm-hmm. to have a war because Finland's in between. Yeah. But at this point, um, Finland and Norway are all Finland's part of... Finland's literally just the battlefield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> kind of like Belgium in the first world. Yeah. But yeah, um, we'll probably have that. But the, um, <laughs> yeah. the um, fin- well, at this point, <laughs> Finland is Finland is uh, Finland and Norway are part of the Swedish yeah. uh, kingdom. Oh, and kingdom it's basically a, a major power in its own right. Isn't yeah. it? and I think yeah. you have through definitely through the early periods in place, like uh, when Peter the Great was in charge of Russia mm. in the earlier seventeen hundreds. They his great rival was Sweden. Yeah, a lot yeah. of the time, especially around the north, well, that that kind of sphere Same area. of influence yeah, yeah. was kind yeah. of very hotly contested one, and it still still was at this point. Yeah, but yeah, so. In 1790, Sweden was kind of looking, almost looking for a way out of the war as well, because oh, really? they had gone on a bit too long for good stuff, yeah. and now public support is now waning, <laughs> and his debts are mounting. Yeah. But quite luck- handily for him, in some ways, is they scored probably the most decisive, if not the, de- the decisive battle of the war, was the Battle of Svenskund yeah. in 1790. Is it Sidney uh, Smith? Is it, Smith is, it, is involved in this battle. <laughs> Spearheading the assault. Spearhead- well, he was giving charge Spearheading the assault against his own... Yes, we'll come on to that. Brothers in arms. Hold that thought. Yeah, sorry. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so the battle took place. The sea battle is a vast battle. There's some um, Do you think some accounts. Some time? accounts say it's the, one of the biggest sea battles of all times. Um, oh, wow. And the, what it boils down to is the Russians lost around sixty ships and thousands of men, mm. and the Swedish um, came out of it looking very well. Mm. Sidney Smith at the time was in charge of um, a group of light ships, mm. which I think also shows his sort of bent towards. Um, independent command and thinking, yeah. kind of thing, rather than um, sort of moving forward and agreeing. Yeah, sort exactly. Of he's kind of phalanx. Yeah, sort of yeah. hit and run tactics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be able to think outside the box a bit. Yeah. But 
as you said earlier. Really I, I would say as well. Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt too much. But on that point, the um, it's interesting that this is becoming more and more. Uh, there's a trend here between the na- this increasingly hit and run structile naval tactics, and uh, on land, obviously, until this point, it was like pretty normal for you to march in line. Mm-hmm. And fire, you know, everybody fired at the yeah. same time. You know, wore a bright uniform. You stood in, you were that was iron yeah. discipline. There's no, no independent thought. Indeed, yeah. And then gradually, as, as you see in, you know, um, in the Napoleonic Wars and the Revolutionary Wars, you see the emergence of skirmishes like the rifles mm-hmm. in sharp. Yeah. And there, but the, the, what I mean is, there it's a similar yeah. and style of soldiering to what's yeah. in And they're, they're basically handpicked because <coughs> they can have independent thought and exactly. think of their own tactics on, yeah. on the hoof yeah. as well. But yeah, so um, as you also mentioned earlier, this battle obviously it almost brought to an end the war with a month later the war there was a peace treaty signed and mm. both sides settled down but it Sidney Smith on the one hand did well from it because he was knighted by the Swedish king mm. by Gustav but also as you said um on the other hand it did quite actually quite a lot of bad for his career because on the other side the Russian side there were quite a few Royal Navy officers serving there mm. and a large number of them lost their lives in the battle and when he came back from <clears> the war their friends and their sort of comrades Blamed him because um, yeah. he was probably you know he was a he was a useful figure because he was there. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, this, yeah. They, there was quite a lot of enmity from his yeah. brother officers at the time because he'd been on the other side. Yeah, and he'd you know in some way contributed to the death of various Royal Navy officers. I wonder whether uh, did they dislike him before or was it more like this is like the rumor that dogged his career mm. throughout. Well, not rumor, but the the, the, the thing, yeah. or legend that dogged his career throughout. I think he he was because he was like, he was also kind of quite uh, dismissively called the Swedish knight for most of his career yeah, because yeah. he wasn't knighted in Britain but he was knighted in Sweden <laughs> I think yeah. before he went he would not he would not he'd been almost a bit of a non-entity to the yeah. wider navy because yeah. you know he was just a he was just a low relatively low ranking yeah. officer but when he came back he was this hero in the Swedes Swedes eyes yeah. for it was infamous. Being, yeah, infamous in many ways yeah. Um, but yeah so that was his second kind of war which yeah. you know we've seen again he's using his sort of thinking yeah, he's yeah, been yeah, rewarded yeah. on one hand but also it's potentially done damage to his reputation on the other both yeah. of which will come into play a bit later on and in Europe at the time 1790 we've just <coughs> sorry um, we've just had the French Revolution so that's 1799 yeah, yeah, yeah. so kind of just in time just yeah, literally just in time <laughs> um, he's he returned back uh, and at the time there's no the war hasn't entirely started yeah it's, I think it took a while it, to get yeah. going it was provoked yeah, yeah. Um, but when it started um Smith was, well, you could potentially say he was actually on holiday. Um, yeah. <laughs> he was visiting his brother, who was um, part of the diplomatic, British diplomatic mission in Constantinople. Yeah. Um, when the war started in January 1793, um, and when it all started for me, he immediately thought, you know, this is my time to get back in, yeah, into, yeah, into, into active service. Yeah. And he actually commandeered a vessel and yeah. recruited various British sailors from Constantinople, and they sailed this sort of like, ragged vessel back across yeah. the Mediterranean to link up with British forces yeah. and he linked up with them in what actually became quite a for history anyway quite a pivotal battle um, which was too long but... is it right so Ad- Admiral Lord Hood or Lord Admiral Hood I think it's Admiral Lord Hood Admiral Lord Hood um, essentially had sailed in and captured the port let's say, so, so well, you have to think about it in, in the context that the revolutionary forces were not in control of the whole country yeah, it wasn't a cohesive yeah, thing that you know exactly read in some books basically they try and portray it as French people woke up one day, yeah, exactly. didn't believe and in the divine right of kings, they were all suddenly revolutionaries, and yeah. then every every part of the machinery of government and army yeah. and navy fell to them. Yeah. I mean, this wasn't obviously the case. Yeah. In the in the Vendée, in sort of so various rural areas of France, there's quite a brutal civil war going on. Yeah. Toulon, as Tim's already said, was held by royalists who yeah. invited various foreign powers to come and help them yeah. because they had this French Mediterranean fleet at their disposal. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is why the British yeah the British sweat in failed, to yeah. capture Toulon, the port where mm-hmm. the, all these ships were still being held, uh, in order to obviously keep it from falling into revolutionary yes. hands and, and obviously invading other yeah. countries. And they weren't the only ones. There was the Spanish, there was the Spanish and Neapolitan navies there as well. Oh, okay, because yes. as, as Tim's already said, so you know, of... we had the crowned heads of Europe all looking quite nervous yeah. at this newly republican uh, yeah. in general, yeah. general country. Oh, yeah. um, Sidney Smith sort of. T- Sort of turns up in his in his, yeah. in his ship. He, he turns up and, his, and his, as, as you know, not even as he's not employed by the no, navy at this he's point. He's basically a private citizen yeah. with a ship and yeah. a sort of raggedy crew. Yeah, um, he turns up that. And and, when he, he, and essentially the, the revolutionary forces are converging on too long. Yeah, a sort of then unknown artillery officer on the, <laughs> on, the, on the French Republican side, known as one Napoleon Bonaparte, mm. who had managed to kind of encircle too long with various 
batteries and was firing, basically menacing the harbour and the Allied fleet that was in there. So they yeah. kind of realised that the game was up in many ways because yeah. they he surrounded Napoleon had basically surrounded the town and made it unsafe for the um, ships to be there. Yeah. Essentially, on the way out, the British were like, "Well, we can't just leave all these ships here, so we should probably burn them. Mm-hmm. Probably should just just take them out of the war, yeah. essentially." And uh, I think that was what Sidney Smith was tasked to do. Was that not yeah, well, correct? I think he was actually even tasked to do. I think he just turned up and he volunteered. Yeah, to, yeah, he wasn't even technically part of the navy at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was very, he was essentially a private citizen because uh, he hadn't been fully yeah. gazetted back in. He's not um, so he turned, half pay captain. I think he was, but I think that that status doesn't okay. really accord to you yeah, as a part of them. Navy proper kind of thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and so he basically turned up and was given, or he, like he, I think he requested, and was given the task of leaving the British element of destroying the fleet yeah. and the Spanish sent a grouping as well. Yeah. And he, his, his um, sort of party did well. They uh, went into what was then the sort of new arsenal. So the and they destroyed ten ships of the line. So this is the the big battleships yeah, kind of yeah. thing, out of around thirty two. And, and also there were thirty two in total. Thirty two in total okay, yeah. of ships of the line, and also yeah. there were also. There are 14 frigates, which okay. are slightly smaller Small ships. Ones, yeah. He destroyed 10 of the ships of the line, and, and um, we're not sure about how many fleets actually destroyed, but it yeah. was equoted to several. Right. Yeah. Third. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it. no, third. Yeah, just make it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, 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 yeah, third of the ships of the line. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah third of the ships of the line. Yeah, well, very yeah. fish. Yeah. Um, but the Spanish didn't do quite as well. Yeah, so uh, whilst Sidney Smith and his men were rampaging around destroying his ships, and he also destroyed a huge stockpile of wood mm. um, and, the, and rope as well, which we'll come on to a bit later. The Spanish didn't do very well they mm. didn't get to the heart they didn't get to actually into the process of destroying them they came out Sidney Smith and his men yeah. saw that this was happening and turned back to try and destroy a few more and mm. what they could but they were too late and the French Republican forces had taken what was left of the shipping so yeah. although he accomplished his task very well mm. I think in many ways he was kind of hampered by the fact that he was literally a man who turned up yeah, yeah, the bosses, rather than any plan being put in place by anyone yeah. else. He was it sounds like nobody him, really was, yeah, yeah. Him turning up in some rather ineffective ally to try and do this rather rather important job. Well, I was thinking earlier, perhaps, because, um, you know, I mean, we'll go on to this, but he was, he was actually re- arrested for this because obviously he did it while he was a private citizen. I was yeah. wondering whether that was the reason they, you know, Lord Hood was like, oh, well, you can do this because you're not, you don't matter because you're not. Maybe, 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 maybe. We would have thought though, if you, if a naval officer had done it, then mm-hmm. would that not be seen as an act of war anyway? Yeah, so well, I mean, they were already. Well, I don't. I think yeah, it was just exactly, literally yeah. he was the man who t- who turned him a volunteer for it. They're like, yeah. oh, jolly good show, old chap. Yeah, and see think, you later. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And I think <laughs> in you know straight afterwards, he was kind of he was kind of rewarded for it, and that he was tasked with Hood by yeah. Hood to carrying the dispatches back. So it's yeah. quite a relatively important and honourable role because he was the one who would take the news back what happened right, to, okay. to, yeah. to, to the country and then after this he was given command of what was known as a fifth rate vessel which is yeah. it's actually one of the lower the smaller ships but still it's, it's a ship so yeah. he's got it's a sixth rate yeah it's been a sixth rate <laughs> <laughs> get but, on yeah. so on the one hand he, you know, Hood's rewarded him a bit by giving this position of honour and he's been given a ship at the end of it as well Yeah. but people like Nelson and also other officers like Lord Collingwood mm. who was Nelson's kind of subordinate at Chicago yeah. Just blamed him. him for the fact that the ships weren't the, all of the ships weren't destroyed yeah. again I think he was just almost like up, he, was, he was kind of just wrong person at the wrong time because uh, with the Swedish role <laughs> that so element yeah. Yeah, he didn't actually personally kill all of those red, red yeah. officers and in this, he, he destroyed a base as much as he could have done. Yeah, but he was yeah. still seen as kind of a hate figure for yeah. an easy sort of scapegoat yeah. for the perceived failure of the task. Yeah, yeah. Um, he I mean, well, as we discussed before, it was like he wouldn't have even been there. Yeah, if he hadn't had had sort of sense yeah. of yeah, exactly. Yeah, so fuck you, Nelson. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the more and more you read about this, I feel like well, I think I'm, more yeah. on 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 the, um, Sydney Smith's side. Yeah, and I think after the... After I mean, not that I, know, I mean, you know, yeah, we yeah. might have to read more. Yeah. Of it. We're not descended from him, just no, <laughs> honestly. Just yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're not. I mean, we would be pretty yeah. cool. Um, if anyone wants to research our <laughs> connections <laughs> to Sydney Smith, please uh, send us an email. Yeah. Yeah. Episodes. And we will provide DNA. Uh, yeah, we, we should probably point out as well, this uh, episode will be put on the uh, com slash four. Nice. Good branding. Yeah, and so after he's given command of the HMS Diamond, yeah, um, the, fifth, the, 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 the fifth rate, um, yeah. he kind of like showed that he, you know, he was again this independent thinker because he was going around, he block, he was involved in um, establishing a garrison to on a sort of outcrop outside La Havre to try and blockade it. Yeah. He was he was in and around the French coast trying to disrupt their shipping. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, he actually in uh, he, his, this offence kind of 
shall we say, tide turned against him slightly. All <laughs> yeah. the way to the one in one of these one of these missions, he went into Bre- yeah. went to Brest Harbour um, yeah. to want to see how many ships the French had in there. Yeah. And then him and his secretary decided to try and steal one of them <laughs> by cutting the anchor cables so um, at night. But then um, they were caught trying to sail it out. Um, Oh no! So they're trying to say out oh, of the half, not not Brest. My okay, yeah. Uh, so he did sneak into Brest Harbour to yeah. see how many ships they had in there. Then he also went into the half, tried to steal the ship. To do the same thing. Yeah, to steal the ship. Yeah, tried to steal the ship as well, but was caught um, by the yeah. French and they imprisoned him in the temple, which is this the temple prison, which is kind of like the um, after the Bastille. It's probably the most famous of the oh, French really? prisons. Okay. In that, yeah. you know, the Bastille was destroyed at this point, but um, yeah. it's where they put a lot of the royalists. And yeah. the, I, I think Mary Antoinette may have been there as well at that oh, wow. point. At this point, his, yeah, he was captured, thrown into the temple, and um, his action in Toulon, as you already, hint, already hinted at, kind of came back to haunt him at this point, didn't it? Yeah, well, he was in prison because of that. Is that all right? Yeah, it is, but I mean, more than that, um, the French also accused him of a harson. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And they yeah, basically yeah. tried him as a private citizen, yeah, uh, and they imprisoned yeah. him as a private citizen. Um, because uh, because he wasn't uh, a navy a yeah, full naval yeah. officer at the time, he burned all the ships. Yeah, and this kind of had knock on effect because during the time you could exchange officers for one another and men for one another, but although it tries the British might to exchange him, the French kept refusing um, to to exchange to exchange this British yeah. because they said, "Oh no, he's here's a private officer. citizen." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he spent so yeah, yeah. So yeah. essentially, he spent a few spent two years in prison mm. um, at this point because the French refused to send him back. Um, and the at this point, at one point, yeah. uh, two years later, so um, after he spent quite a while in there, I think he at one point he actually was in charge of aspiring as well within the within the, the prison. prison. Yeah, or like he was running agents out of the prison. But he was like constantly and, doing this anyway. Yeah, just a bit of yeah. random stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, sort of just like being self busy. I think, yeah, anyways. Yeah. But he was then broken out of prison by royalist agents. Yeah, and I think it's kind of was like an amusing side note. The British then sent back a French officer. Once he put him back, it's kind of like, <laughs> yeah. like, like he, no, he is actually. Not yeah, he is an officer. Yeah. We'll, we stand by our agreement. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, and so he, yeah, he comes back, and again, he's. I think by this point, he's shown that, you know, he's capable. He's capable. He's brave. He's he's clearly clear headed, and he's given actually. Um, we're up to about seventeen ninety nine now. Yeah. Um, so he's been given a command of the HMS Tigre, um, yeah. which is an 80-gun ship of the line, so like the big beast kind of yeah, thing, yeah, the, yeah. the biggest ship you can have. So first ship of the line, first, first right, yeah. yeah first. <laughs> he's gone all the way from a fifth to the first kind yeah. of thing. No, like um, a big captain. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. a Commodore now, yeah, in fact. Yeah. Um, is he, he is a Commodore, yeah. yeah. And he's got, he's got, I think he's got a small squadron of people as well. Okay, yeah. And he is he's dispatched to help the Turks because they were oh, yeah. I mean, coming into the war yeah. against Napoleon because he's now, at this point, Napoleon basically set off on his big... He swept down to Egypt. Egypt. He right. swept over to Egypt. Find the mysteries of the, yeah. <laughs> like the, the, the ancient treasures of the pyramids. Yeah, basically. Yeah. But, um, I, I think Napoleon, obviously, like, is just such a, like... If there was, like, a, you know, um, tarot card readings and all this kind of stuff, Napoleon would be right up there, don't we? Yeah. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Greatness and all this crap. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and it, let's see, yeah, Napoleon's yeah. gone on, I think, basically, as he said, to... In many ways, just stoke in glory. Kind yeah, of yeah, to, like, literally, yeah. Connect with yeah. the ancients and that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, um, he well, essentially because he uh, it's quite quite weird when you read about the book because because there are a couple of book I've read a couple of books on this during my um, university years. He was basically a, like he, he went before he became before he became an artillery and why he was so good at the artillery officer job I think as well because he was really good at maths mm-hmm. and wanted to be recognised as some like great scientist in his own right. And then for some reason he got this obsession with ancient Egypt. Yeah. Um, so basically set forth to to capture Egypt mm-hmm. so that he could show that he conquered the yeah I, I, yeah I'm not, I'm not really sure what, what the objective was but basically to, yeah, to amplify his own glory mm-hmm. uh, you can't really I mean I suppose it's not really to, to the British concern uh, in any kind of British concern until basically he starts threatening the Middle East yeah because I think he almost got almost like he'd he'd done pretty well on land relatively well on land I think he'd, he'd seen off the um Indigenous forces at the yeah. back of the pyramids and that yeah. type of thing, but um, I think the British were kind of concerned about how whether he was going to start going into the Middle East and then yeah. potentially opening up a um, potentially opening up a line to attack India as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then things went better for the British in that Nelson destroyed most of Napoleon's fleet at the Battle of the Nile and mm. almost trapped him in there. Yeah. Um, and then I think yeah. So then there was this. Well, that would have been his sort of get out of jail free card, wouldn't it? Because he arrived by ship. Yeah, and they could just hop back across the... Um, and, then, and then obviously... The just, yeah, exactly, exactly. But um, if you're on a ship, then you have yeah, to go by land. Not, yeah. yeah. I think this this did kind of tip the scales on sea, at least, for a yeah, while, because yeah. the British could then, instead of having to worry about this large French fleet, could then disperse a bit, and then mm-hmm. move, and then 
then uh, attack various ports or help yeah. support their allies. And this is kind of what Sidney Smith was tasked to do. Yeah. Um, he was dispatched, as we said, to help the Turks and yeah. directly against Napoleon because, as we said, Napoleon was looking in, at the Middle East with kind of his usual acquisitive glare um, and trying to establish a bit of an empire for himself mm. um, and France. Yeah. And that he kind of rampaged into what is now, now Israel um, yeah. and then various towns, uh, I think, such as... Um, Jaffa and other ones yeah, fell yeah. on his way and then he sort of then marched all basically all the way up um, Israel to Acre which is a port on in the northwest of Israel yeah I mean, it's a port so it has to be in the west of yeah, it, I mean, it, 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 yeah. Um, I mean it, it's quite I mean it's quite culture, sort of cultural has cultural import, symbolic importance yeah it's the sort of last last outpost of the crusade yes absolutely yeah last, like, yeah. last one yeah. Um, and yeah so it has that history already but then yeah. everyone kind of you, know, you, you can often think about that siege of Acre but this one is Almost as important for well, yeah. Napoleon, especially, but as we'll see. But at this point, Sidney Smith has arrived at Acre, and Napoleon arrives to besiege it, mm. basically. And Acre's in flames. Acre's in flames. Yeah. <laughs> and this is kind of like I think we've we've discussed this point, kind of the high point of Sidney Smith's career. Yeah. Because this is where he has he anchors his his um, his flagship and his small um, flotilla of ships as well to, to provide sort of covering fire to the walls and bombard Napoleon's force on land. Yeah. And then he kind of dealt, deals him a hammer blow by intercepting and capturing his siege artillery. So these are the heavy guns that can use, be used yeah. to basically pummel down a wall. Break down the yeah. And then that, so Napoleon is basically forced to rely on his field artillery, which is a lot lighter. Yeah. Um, and his infantry, which obviously can't really do anything unless they have a breach to attack yeah. or yeah. ladders long enough to climb up. Yeah. And so, you know, Sidney Smith really frustrates him at this point because he's basically taking away any chance he has of taking the city yeah. and taking a port back onto a major port onto the Mediterranean. And um, eventually, after a few months, he just basically gives up, kind of thing, Napoleon. Yeah. Um, and he manages to get away home and leaves his men behind. Yeah. Well, he, um, he returns to France, doesn't he, basically? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, well, um, destiny was calling him again. But <laughs> I, I think, I think yeah. well, first of all, he was running away from his, well, quite, I was sympathetic, but, um, you know, unsuccessful um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, you know, um, jolly to the Middle East, uh, to the yeah. Middle East basically, um, and um, I think basically this is the point where he comes back and sort of makes himself. He, uh, he stages a coup essentially. Establishes him, himself. Yeah, establishes himself as the yeah. first consul of France. Interesting. I think I've just read earlier that he managed to um, get a hero's welcome back into France, even yeah. though he had failed miserably. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> ludicrous, isn't it? Um, um, but then, yeah, so I think that probably helped him along the way. Yeah, and it was like, oh, you're going to run for office, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. like, I am the office. <laughs> um, or, as, no, as, or as Louis XIV would say, the state is me. Or yeah, exactly. Yeah. I am the state, I think. So yeah. kind of similar things. Yeah, I imagine. Um, um, so yeah, I think this kind of. Well, I was going to say, it, sorry. Then, then obviously later becomes emperor, but yeah. 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 Um, and I think, but this defeat kind of rankled with him, I think, because, and he very much singles Sidney Smith out as the man who had done it, because he says of Sidney Smith that he is the man who made me miss my destiny. <laughs> um, because yes, yeah. Um, and once he left, I think Smith was held in high regard by the Turkish forces there because he was accorded quite a lot of leeway to negotiate with the French and mm. brought, he negotiated a treat, treaty which would see the French forces basically surrender and yeah. he, they would be repatriated back to France yeah, yeah. which would have been quite I think a, a, in many ways probably a favourable end to the war because it yeah. would mean that the Britain wouldn't need to expend huge amounts of men and money and manpower to actually take these very strongholds the French had taken and yeah. force them out um, but unfortunately this treaty was um Shall we say, unofficial? It was unofficial. It was unofficial. Um, and then basically shouted down. Yeah, Nelson. Nelson was was uh, sort of apoplectic with rage. Because it let, <laughs> it let, it probably, I think he's probably sort of letting the French off the hook. Well, I mean, um, I, I can see where he's coming from. I mean, it, uh, you can, you can, yeah, if you're going to send them all back to France, then they will just send them out again. But yeah, uh, yeah. They, I think they would have done. But I think at the it's same the time, I think they it's kind of like it, at the moment they. You know, it's one of the things where you, you you don't want to fight that kind of a trapped enemy kind of thing. So yeah, they will. They will. They do more damage. Exactly. So if you can get them out. Absolutely. Peacefully, you might as well do that. Yeah. Um, but you know, you know, for better or worse, um, Smith's um, treaty was put to one side, and the fighting continued to around 1801 yeah. when the French were expelled from the area from on very similar terms to actually the ones he negotiated. Um, <laughs> Originally, so yeah. Similar. So again, it's kind of like a way that he was almost yeah. so close but yet so far. He'd, he'd yeah. almost he'd almost achieved this great victory in in the Swedish War, but he was he was negatively impacted by yeah. the naval losses, the Royal Naval losses, and then again burning the French fleet. But he wasn't quite seen as blamed for that. Now he's won yeah. a great victory at Acre, but he wasn't really allowed to follow it through with this treaty that would have shortened the war in that yeah, theatre. Yeah. And then, you know, what he negotiated basically happened anyway, but yeah. after loss of men and 
money. Yeah. Um, is it not true at this point? War is over essentially for a bit. Yeah, so or after, is that coming up? it's coming up. So I mean, yeah. after this bit happens, so 1801 is when the French are mm. kind of expelled from the Middle East. Yeah. Then 1802, March 1802, is when there is the end of the what's called the French Revolutionary Wars. Yeah. Um, and then um, just one year later, actually, about just around yeah. maybe 1803, they start up again into the Napoleonic Wars, which yeah. is when Napoleon, as you said, is it's crown, he's crown, ruling. Yeah. And then crowns uh, himself emperor and then celebrates yeah, the, with a bloody the war. New war, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think this. As you said, this this really did mark the high point of, well, the high water mark in many ways. Yeah, it's, 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 it's career. Career. Um, it, I think it, you know, in 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 reflection, he's quite a resourceful kind of guy, and, and actually, in a way, you can see, as I think you're you're going to sort of describe his his, his work after this, like his non non military work, well, mm. some military work, I suppose, but um, um, obviously overshadowed by Nelson in more you know, more ways than one. Yeah, but both, both you know both shouted down by him, but also was you know. Overshadowed by him in reputation, yeah, so. and also kind of mistrusted by him as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After yeah. and then yeah. yeah. So I think he was one of those people. He's almost like an outsider throughout yeah. because of this this sort of reputation that often probably not really his fault has been built up yeah. about him. Wrongly or right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you know he did. Um, there were, he he was seen as quite brash and arrogant by a lot of <laughs> the other officers. So I think there was an element that he was also doing it to himself a little bit. So he yeah, had various yeah. quotes throughout. So the the first Lord of the Admiralty, um, this a bit later on during the Napoleon Wars, said that the seems to be such a want of judgment in our friend Sir Sidney that um, it's much safer to employ him under command than in command. Um, want of, it's interesting to say want of judgment. So I think he was kind of seen as like almost a bit of a loose cannon as well. Yeah. Uh, perhaps because <laughs> so of... Many yeah. shit I mean, there's just too many of them. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, um, Maybe this is where they all come from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all from Sir Sidney Smith. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sir Sidney Smith. <laughs> yeah, the Swedish knight. Yeah. But, um, but yes, yeah, so I think part of the reputation was himself, but part of it also was these events that yeah. you know, he didn't really have much... You know, if it was looked on with slightly more favourable eyes, he would have been... Well, like, in, 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 in many ways, he was very helpful. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, coming over as, a, as you know, not as part of the album. Mm. Then I suppose you could say, oh, he was just looking for work. But I don't know, yeah. Well, he but, was doing you know, what he knew what to do, kind of thing. Like, yeah, yeah, true, yeah. And, and anyway, yeah. but after the, after the wars began again in 1803, he, during this time he'd done it, he'd, he'd been an MP... Yeah, as well, weird enough, but during the peace. Uh, yeah. He had, he had a reputed affair with Karen of Brun- Brunswick, yeah. who was the um, wife of the Prince of Wales, I think, at this point. Yeah. Prince yeah. of Egypt, maybe? I, I, think, I think, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and then I think when the war started again, he kind of showed his new, his sort of, again, this mind of independent thought by yeah. championing new weapons like rockets and torpedoes and yeah. mines, and he tried to use them on an attack on Boulogne, which went a bit wrong, but. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But still, you know, but I think he was hampered, as we said, by the fact that. Trafalgar in 1805 really broke the back of the French yeah. Navy. Well, that was the glor- that was a glorious victory that basically yeah. enshrined Nelson as the hero of the revolution, uh, of the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, and but also meant that there was no more sea battling to be done. Yeah, and it kind of strangled off many sort of officers' careers in many ways because yeah. they didn't have these big set piece battles to show themselves off in. Yeah. and they, he did have a few more sort of um, shining charms, moments. shining moments. Like he was he was around in in Italy. He tried to sort of he was involved in fighting the French there yeah. and he although he he quarreled with superiors there as well and Lord <laughs> Collingwood um, who basically succeeded Nelson yeah. um, thought he'd been sent to sent there basically just to torment to so the Admiral would be rid of, rid of Tormentor <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and then 1807 he was involved in evacuating the Portuguese royal family yeah. from Lisbon out of the clutches of the French yeah. um, down to South America so he was still where we will return in a different yeah, sense, yeah. So. He, was, he was slowly being promoted so he was Promoted from Commodore up to Vice Admiral in 1810. Yeah, but it wasn't like a meteoric rise by any sort of yeah. imagination. It was literally because it was like turning over the engine. Kind of yeah, thing. kind of thing. Oh, like he had reached the seniority. To, yeah. yeah, he was yeah. next in line because I think he didn't build these good relations with his superiors, yeah. kind of thing. So yeah. he was basically promoted when they had to promote him rather than because they wanted to promote him, even if, though he was scoring success. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah funnily enough, actually, there's an interesting point about the. Uh, I think in the artillery, uh, is a side point really mm-hmm. about the British Army. Uh, one of the amusing things about the British Army, but the seniority, the aspect of you had to reach a certain age to be of a certain rank, <laughs> is um, uh, part of in the artillery in the artillery regiments. It was like you know you had to be of a certain age mm-hmm. to actually to actually be in charge. You you couldn't be younger than <laughs> X number of years. That's brilliant. So maybe it was sort of a bit of a bit of that. I think it pretty much was. I think you had to basically do your time. Kind yeah, of thing. it was like, well, you're not old enough to become the Admiral. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. I mean, in 17, I mean, how old was he at this point? Because in 1777, he was like 13. Yeah. So, 
1797 would be 33. Oh, maybe he's getting, yeah, he's getting on a bit. He's he? getting on, yeah. but I think other people have been, gone faster than him, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Nelson he's fast track. Yeah, Nelson. He was promoted to glory. Yeah. <laughs> and by the time the war ends, in well, the war, Napoleon Wars ends for kind of the first time. Yeah. Uh, in yeah, 1814. Yeah. He's about the last, yeah. so <laughs> the last two years basically blockading Boulogne, which is because the French refused to come out of their ports in any great strength in the last, as we said. Yeah. He, that was ten basically all he could do. Yeah, basically the last ten years there was no big pitch battle yeah. in, on, with the fleets on the high seas. Yeah. And so this was how he ended his, well, well his naval career really, yeah. Yeah, blockading ports and from, you know, from the high point of, of burning ships in too long and you know, yeah. seeing Napoleon off in the Middle East, he was kind of left doing kind of bread and butter almost yeah. work for, for the Navy. Yeah. Okay, and then, but 1814, he left he left the Navy by this point when the war ended and he kind of started pursuing a new career as a... Then it was like the search for a new career almost yeah, because yeah, yeah. You know, this, t- this basically Napoleon had been thrown off to Elba. They were like, now, now the ogre has gone. Yeah. Let's remake the He'll country. never come back. Remake the world. He was never going to escape from this island that's just in the train a few hundred, a few miles away from the French coast with yeah. a group of his soldiers. <laughs> anyway, yeah. He'll never get out. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> He'll just stop. Um, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so then he was looking around for a new job and he sort of looked at this... At this point, it was probably seen as quite a scourge of um, of the shores around British Island, which was and most of Europe, really enough, uh, which the Barbary pirates, which were yeah. really from the North African coast. A fascinating they, uh, kind of thing. I, I, I think potentially a footnote of history episode yes, so. could be in these gentlemen. Excellent, not gentlemen. Though. Look out uh, for it. Yeah, <laughs> coming soon. But yeah, um, and they, so they, <laughs> these were these were <laughs> these were corsairs pirates who would yeah. basically sail out and and basically capture and enslave people from as far away as Iceland and then take them down to the North African coast and, Lord. and then sell them into slavery. And he kind of fixated on them as a, a new enemy kind of thing. Mm. And so he was went around lobbying people for funds to build up this, um, to one, I think, pay ransoms for people who've been enslaved and also start up, which uh, seems a cross between some sort of knightly order and a coast guard um, <laughs> yeah. to basically take them on um, yeah, yeah, yeah. when they came near Britain and British, British waters. Yeah. And he travelled to the Congress of Vienna, which is where the the big peace talks were happening after yeah. the war to lobby for more funds. Yeah. And it's on his way back that he kind of um, enters the last big military part of his career, which is when, surprise, surprise, Napoleon's gone off the <laughs> little island, <laughs> back for his 100 days of glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, Specifically 100 days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was then his time was expired. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah. As, as we all know, he met Wellington at Waterloo. Yeah. And then, but Sidney Smith was actually, I think he was in Brussels at the time the battle started, and of course Sidney Smith being Sidney Smith. Yeah. Um, March the sound of the guns on like, yeah. Napoleon's forces that should have done that instead of chasing I'm not sure. Do you think people actually know where Waterloo is? Good point. Let's, yeah, do you want to it's not Waterloo, Waterloo, London, is it? It's basically yeah, <laughs> it. Napoleon did not, did not get on the, yeah. on the train and arrive at the station. Is it south of Brussels? I think it is south of Brussels, no? Yeah, well, I think it was. It's basically Bel- yeah. I mean, Belgium uh, didn't really exist at the time. No. It was didn't. created in 1830. Mm-hmm. So it's what it's now, then, now yeah. Belgium. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. and this is where. Uh, Napoleon marched his troops because yeah. and where Wellington basically chose to meet him yeah. to fall yeah. back and then having the ground of his choosing indeed yeah, yeah. Um, having manoeuvred the Prussians into the first wave but yeah yeah yeah, yeah sorry but yeah um, anyway the battle was <laughs> taking place and Sidney Smith rode out onto the field to locate Wellington because you know he thought this is again kind of similar to too long you know there's a you know, Britain needs my help kind of thing and yeah. Wellington met him and put him in command of organising the care of the wounded which was I think by all accounts, actually very well done by him. Mm. Um, he cared for both French and Allied troops as okay. well. So, yeah. I mean, he showed himself to be, again, a good organiser. And then in yeah. the ending of, well, well, after the Battle of Waterloo happened and sort of the winding up of the campaign, he was put in charge of taking the surrender of the garrisons of Arras and Amiens. Mm. And then he was also given the task of assessing whether Paris was safe enough for the royals to come back to. Mm. So kind of like that's the end point of his military escapade. Is this kind of like... It's quite a big um, position of responsibility in many ways to yeah, 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 actually yeah, be given yeah. the point of saying, is the city safe for them to come back into? Well, especially since like, the first time it definitely wasn't. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whoever did that yeah. job, it's a really yeah. poor job. Yeah. Because then they also put stuff like all of his marshals in the French army as well. Yeah. So you know, like Salt or something like that was a commander in chief of the French yeah. armed forces. Like, but then, but then they'll never go back to the French. There's two sides to that, isn't it? Because obviously, if you decapitate all the big, all the true experienced officers from the army, yeah, what you had in. Uh, obviously Russia not Russia yeah, yeah. sorry yeah. But anyway, so yeah I, mean, I get your point but yeah, yeah. yeah. sort of in the later years of his life he was at long last given a British knighthood as well oh, to go with his so. Swedish knighthood yeah. um, and he ended his days in France really enough in, a, in another footnote of history theme he moved there to escape his creditors um, <laughs> yeah that's quite common <laughs> yeah. But yeah and so he moved to France with his wife and children um, he had three daughters and a son 
and he died in Paris in 1840 and he's buried there with his wife so kind of a well, you know, from sort of a high point of yeah. Acre kind of a slow decline but yeah, you know, with, again yeah. punctuated by these you know these these periods of kind of bursts of activity, bursts of activity yeah. and lots of responsibility evacuating yeah. the royals from Portugal in charge of the wounded at Waterloo yeah. accepting the surrender of garrisons that type of stuff so he was always around yeah, yeah. You know, I think mainly because history has been kinder to Nelson maybe because he had better sort of people publicising him afterwards yeah yeah, yeah. I yeah I think most probably yeah I, I, mean, think he, he, I mean I suppose Nelson was sort of if he broke the back of the French Navy in 1805 sort of single handedly not single handedly but you know, but you know he, he was responsible for the complete defeat. yeah obviously Nelson was but um, then, then um, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I think I suppose it's fair enough. But yeah, yeah there's a problem of seeing of Sydney Smith, isn't it? Yeah, and I think you're there. Also, how old was he when he died? That's like, yeah. like seventy odd. Well, was yeah, at least. Like you know, the life expectancy in these days. Sixty three, like forty something. Yeah, forty five maybe maximum. Mm, this is a man who spent most of his life at sea. Yeah, I know. It's quite ludicrous. punishing conditions. Yeah. Kind of thing. he's been in prison. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think yeah. So I mean, this is a man who obviously, as we said, kind of shows what it is to be a naval officer in many ways. You have these periods of independent command followed by periods of being subordinated to yeah. others periods of extreme activity followed by periods of Nothing. no activity yeah, yeah. Um, and then you will show you what history does to you really if you don't you know you, in some ways you can have these great successes but you also if you don't get on with people at the same time if yeah, people take yeah. against you then your well, reputation will suffer after, you, after you're not there to defend it yeah I, I think it's also indicative of potentially a certain amount of politics in the oh yeah absolutely the yeah. yeah absolutely yeah I think so, so I think yeah, that is Sidney Smith kind of Nelson's, Nelson's shadow and Napoleon the mirror kind of thing yeah Napoleon's um, mirror yeah because um, there is his rise into it on his yeah. um, or his attempted sort of glorification at Acre, uh, Acre and then um, at his fall in Waterloo indeed yeah. but yeah so do you have any further reading at all um, well um, there is obviously the biographies of Sidney Smith yep um, I was going to say uh, he he um, I think it's. I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to be like, you know, but it's quite suspicious that he's at every major event. Like usually, you would see that as aston as astonishing. Usually, when you look back on this kind of period, and if a, sol a soldier's memoirs yeah. say they've been at every major event, they're obviously made up. Like that guy, like, telling me about yeah. him. Could you do that one? That's a good yeah, yeah. history ending point there, or yeah. not ending point? Just, um, yeah, it's on the Peninsula War. Yeah, Peninsula War. Well, yeah, I can't remember what his name is, but um, essentially there are a couple of versions of this. And um, basically, because the Peninsula War is the sort of first one where a large number of larger number of soldiers are able to read and write by you know, by the end of it than any other war previously, um, you have a lot of memoirs, and there are sort of certain memoirs that look at particular battles and you know particular places where soldiers were, and then there's this one memoir that came out sort of quite a bit later. Um, that was at every major battle somehow <laughs> it's a bit like sort of sharp yeah. where it's just everywhere and you know personally responsible for this <laughs> um, and obviously yeah it's turned out to be a complete fraud and basically <laughs> just pieced together the histories of everybody else's memoirs and then turned it into a book but that's yeah so that's what it sounds like with Sidney Smith yeah. I'm sure it's not true I'm sure it's not well yeah I think, and how can it be? how can it be it's casting aspersions on this man Indeed. but I have a couple of he's had enough Kind yeah. Of wrong. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Leave him alone. <laughs> but I have a couple. Who of are you, Nelson? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, the Nelson Appreciation Society's back in force. Yeah. I, I've I've got a few bits of further reading. Um, as you've alluded to already, his correspondence and memoirs have been published, and then also more recently, a few biographies have been uh, written about him. One, A Thirst for Glory, by Tom Pocock, and also another one, Beware of Heroes: Admiral Sir Sidney Smith's War Against Napoleon, by Peter Shankland. Both of which are well worth reading if you can get hold of them. That's, that was Sidney Smith, um, Nelson's Shadow, Napoleon's Mirror. Um, one of the lesser known, I think. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's you know it's time for us to move. Um, it's time for us to move Nelson over in our, in our pantheon here, indeed. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Footnotes of History. For more episodes, visit footnotesofhistory.com and subscribe. Or if you want to suggest an episode to us, email us on episodes at footnotesofhistory.com. You can also follow us on social media at FOH Podcast, Twitter, and we're also on Instagram and YouTube. Thanks for listening.